And as we get uh, started today, I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about the final. Uh, the final is coming up on April 27th. Uh, for the face-to-face -face class, it is at 10 o'clock. Um, so it's going to be a little bit earlier than what we normally um, have class on, uh, on the 27th. That is a Monday. The study guide is available on Blackboard, uh, study guide number two. And the first part, the first two parts of the exam will be very similar in uh, format to the, um, the midterm, in that I have a list of terms, and uh, you'll need to know those terms for multiple choice questions, um, short answer questions. There will be an essay. Um, based on the material since the midterm. And then there will also be a comprehensive essay uh, about some uh, major things that we've looked at throughout the course. For um, the, uh, the first section, the terms, I've tried to uh, help you out even more by focusing on the kind of things I really want you to know. So, for example, when it comes to the heavenly kingdom, you know, what, what does that refer to? Where was it? In this case, China. Uh, you know, how is it related to Christianity? Um, and so, under each of these, I've tried to even narrow it a little bit more so you know what kind of things out of those general terms um, that I want you to know for short answer questions or, um, or a, a multiple choice. So, for example, you know, coming out of this question, um, you know, where was the heavenly kingdom movement start A, China, B, Africa, C, right? and so, you know, knowing the general idea about where it was, how it related to Christianity, uh, and then try to do that for the other uh, terms as well. As before with the midterm, if you have a question about any of these, uh, you know, I can't find this in the notes, or I can't find this in the, the PowerPoints, or, you know, um, I'm not really sure what this is, um, you know, let me know. I mean, we, have a, we have a couple weeks here, so, you know, let me, uh, you know, use that time to uh, communicate with me. I try to keep them in order of how we discuss them in class, um, so that you can go through uh, your notes, and you should be able to uh, maybe find them in uh, the... Uh, the readings or, or something like that in case uh, you're not really sure. But certainly, uh, you know, let me know how I can help you uh, in that. And of course, there are there's some material where we haven't covered yet because we still have some ways to go uh, in the course. For the essays for this second half of the course, um, very similar in structure to uh, the essays for uh, the, um, the midterm. And so in each of these, you know, have a political development, one of the sections from politics in the 19th century that you can write about, something in the 20th century that you can write about. Same thing for uh, the others. Right? If you have something, one thing in each of those uh, centuries for each of those questions, you should be in good shape. Um, and remember, I want you to talk as much as you can about any people we talked about, uh, any documents or movements, right? So if we're talking about doctrinal developments uh, related to Christianity, and in the 20th century you want to talk about fundamentalism, you know, we're going to talk today about some um, particular documents and ideas and, and events. Right? To be able to talk about specifics as much as possible is going to help you do well on those essays. So being able to say specific things and not just general things is the route you want to go. So just kind of pick right, one in the 19th, one in the 20th for each of those sections. Know those really well, and then no matter what, which question comes up, you'll be in good shape. As before, I will pick two of these, and you'll have your option for which one that you want to write about. So you'll be writing one essay, one shorter essay, and then there will be one longer essay um, that will be more comprehensive, ask you to pull things together from the entirety of the course. So essentially, um, several of them 
uh, are going to, well, the first one is going to relate to thinking about Christianity now. So how do some of the things that we talk about over the past 15 weeks, right, how does that help us understand how we've gotten to some place now? Right, and so just kind of pick an issue, because it's going to be a very general question. So you could pick something like church and state, and think, okay, how are we talking about church and state in the 21st century? Right? So you could talk about like something today like the, the, um, the religious freedom discussions that are going on in places like Indiana and Arkansas, and say, okay, how, has, how have we gotten to this point where you can talk about, all right, in the Reformation, there was still a lot of discussion about, you know, Calvin had this view of church and state working together and, and all the other kind of things. And then in the 17th century, you know, the Puritans had this model. And in the 18th century, we have the American Revolution. Uh, in the 19th century, we see the, the collapse of uh, the, these church governments. And some of the things we'll talk about here today in the 20th century, some First Amendment cases. Uh, these are the kind of things to think about. And, all right, I got this issue, church and state, or, uh, you know, public morality, or worship styles. Right? And so pick something that you're interested in in contemporary Christianity. Right? Of any, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, a particular denomination, but if there's a particular denomination you want to pick on, uh, not pick on, but pick, <laughs> that sounded bad, I didn't mean to say that, uh, that way. Um, you know, and then think, okay, what have we talked about over the semester that I can pull together to say, okay, we've seen how this has kind of changed and shaped over time to where we are today. Uh, same kind of thing with uh, Christianity and society. Right? And, and probably, depending on how you pick it, you might be able to use the same issue <laughs> if, for either, either question. Right? I mean, if you pick church and state, that could be a political thing, but you could also present it as a, as a cultural thing. Right? So that might be a route to go there as well. But thinking about, you know, tracing that through the, the centuries we've looked at. Um, and then finally, kind of a, a similar type of thing, but essentially these are just kind of historical questions, right? This is what's taken place. This last question would ask you to kind of make an evaluation of what's taken place. So if you think about it, maybe choosing some, thinking about something like Christianity and race or Christianity and African Americans. And talking about, uh, in the 18th century, we have you know, this situation where there's this debate over, um, you know, what will happen if we baptize slaves. And in the 19th century, you know, here are the ways Christians are, are judging um, slavery to be a, a positive thing, a biblical thing. And then we can talk in the, the 20th century about, you know, civil rights. And so all of them are kind of... Um, related in the sense of this broad sweep, but in this last question, thinking about, from a Christian standpoint, from, you know, it's, it's probably most of us in here would identify as Christian, but, but if you, even if you don't, thinking from a, a Christian mindset, how do you view the attitudes we saw towards Christianity and slavery? Uh, you know, how was civil rights a Christian movement? Right? And so that kind of evaluation and not just here's what happened. And so here's what happened, but you know, these arguments made for slavery are not biblical and here's why. Right? And so here too, you know, you're going to be taking an issue, it's going to be a very general question, and you're going to have the, whatever issue you're partic particularly interested in, and then you know, describing here, here's what it was like, and here's what I think about it, based on the teachings of scripture, um, you know, what I think about Christianity, those kind of things. What questions do you have? I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to try and, and construct these questions in such a way that they're very broad where you get to pick something that is particularly interesting to you. So in, in pre preparing for these essays, go back through the notes, go back through the reading. What was most interesting to you? and focus on those kind of things and preparing yourself to talk about those kind of things, to write about those kind of things, um, and I think you'll be in, in good shape. Certainly, if you want to discuss with me, right, come by my office or send me an email and say, if I talk about these kind of things, 
would this be what I should do? And I can tell you, yes, you're on the right track. Right? Here are some things to make sure you would also talk about. You want to talk about this person, you want to talk about this movement, you want to talk about this idea, um, or no, that's not quite what I'm looking for, it's going to be more like this. Right? So let me know how I can help you as you're studying to help you focus on what, you know, because we've been talking 16 weeks. There's no way I could even construct a, quest, a, a test that would cover everything we've covered. So I'm trying to help you figure out, all right, these are the kind of things that I need to focus on, to pay the most attention to um, as I uh, prepare for this exam. Are there any questions right now that you might have that I could help with? All right, well, if anything comes up between now and the 27th, um, by all means, you know, let me know. Get in contact with me. Catch me after class or, or something like that. Um, the exam uh, will be at 10 o'clock, so face-to-face, -face, um, Monday, April 27th. You will have until 11.50, so almost two hours to take the exam. Certainly, if you get done earlier than that, um, you know, you, you don't have to stay for the entire um, hour and 50 minutes. Today, we are uh, continuing our look at uh, the 20th century, Christianity in the 20th century, finishing up with some things related to culture and society and then moving on into doctrine. Um, after today, we have uh, four classes left. Uh, one more class in the 20th century, two on the 21st, since we're only 15 years into it, there's not much we can really say. And then we'll use that last class as a review time, you know, try to help, you know, focus uh, even more on uh, what kind of things to, to pay attention to for uh, the final. Where we finished off on Monday was looking at the demographic changes that occurred in the middle of the 20th century and how an influx of uh, immigrants, uh, particularly from Asia, and uh, with them Asian religions, Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism, brought some change to Christianity as people kind of took parts of those Asian religions and often incorporated them with a, a Christian worldview or uh, decided to convert to one of these religions as well. And essentially what we have here is a, an idea that is frequently called pluralism. Now, what's pluralism is this notion of the positive nature of diversity. That diversity in religion, diversity of race, diversity of gender is a positive. Now, probably most of us would say yes. Right? In, in a variety of, of institutions and places, it's always good to have diverse people, uh, diverse ethnicities, diverse genders. But often with this pluralism came a relativism as well, in that all of these religions were looked at by a lot of people in Western Europe and the United States as um, being on a level playing field. Um, maybe notions like um, they're different paths up the same mountain. Right? They're, they're going to the same direction, they're just taking different ways to get there. And so this pluralism, the presence of diversity, often led to relativism, where all religions were considered alike. Which, within Christianity, while we would certainly say God loves everyone, and as Christians we need to be neighbors to everyone, regardless of the gender, ethnicity, um, country of origin, race, any of that, sexual orientation, right? we're to love our neighbor as ourselves no matter who our neighbor is. There are also some exclusive claims Christianity makes about salvation, about God. And so pluralism has often found itself in conflict with those Christians who want to maintain that the Bible teaches an exclusive view of God. We should love our neighbors as ourselves, but there's also some things that are special about Jesus and so he stands differently than someone like Muhammad, the Buddha, uh, you know, important um, Hindu um, gurus or other things like that. And so that's the one side of pluralism in the 20th century. 
The other side of pluralism in the 20th century was thinking about, is thinking about the influence Christianity had on American government. Especially as more and more people from non-Christian faiths came to the country, some of the laws, some of the practices within the United States underwent changes because of reinterpretations, particularly by the Supreme Court, on First Amendment rights related to religion. And so not only is this a movement to incorporate diverse groups beyond Christianity of religious people, there was also the push to recognize that there are people, and there have been people in the United States, who have no religion, which we might term atheists. Um, and more and more, some people refer to themselves as having no religion, but, but also being spiritual. But particularly, I'm thinking about uh, you know, the rise of, of, of atheism in the United States. So I want to share with you just three courses, uh, three court cases that came before the Supreme Court in the, the middle of the 20th century related to this issue of Christianity's impact on the political life of the United States. The first is Torcaso v. Watkins, uh, which was a, court, a case that came before the Supreme Court in 1961. <clears throat> it had to do with notary publics in Maryland. Now, a notary public, if you don't know, is someone who is, a, is essentially a governmental official, but most people go to the notary public to have a document witness, um, and essentially, you know, if you have something where a witness has to affirm that this person is who they say they are, uh, you know, you bring in your driver's license and you have to sign it in front of them and they have a stamp that they put on it. Well, how does this have anything to do with Christianity? Right? And it's this governmental official saying, okay, this person who signed this document did so in front of me. No republics in Maryland in the 20th century had to declare that they believed in God in order to become a notary republic. And so, essentially, here is a religious qualification, a religious test, in order to participate in this government office. But, of course, in the 1960s, uh, there were a lot of people who are religious who, don't, who didn't necessarily believe in God. Buddhists might be almost atheistic, uh, you know, still spiritual, of course, but you know, there's no single notion of a supreme God like there would be in Christianity, Judaism, or even Islam. Uh, Taoists, the same way. And of course, atheists as well wouldn't fit into this. And so here are people excluded because of their religious or non-religious beliefs. Ultimately, the Supreme Court decided that this violated the First Amendment. And as it made decisions over the next several years, the Supreme Court essentially decided that the freedom of religion also meant freedom from religion. And so it's not just about anybody can practice what they want. There should be the opportunity for atheists not to be impacted in public life, government life, by religion as well. Two particular court cases in the 1960s kind of bore that out. The first was Engel v. Vitale. In New York State, uh, the regents, uh, the individuals that are, are kind of in charge of the public school system in New York, had crafted what they considered to be a non-denominational, non-sectarian prayer to be said in public schools every day. And the goal was that this is part of the moral and spiritual education of students. Right? And if you've gone through public schools uh, recently, you, you know, this quite, sounds quite foreign to us, but at one time, school prayer was a part of the public school day. Ultimately, that the, the Supreme Court decided uh, that this could possibly end up as religious persecution because of enforcing people, even irreligious people, to participate in this prayer. There wasn't an option for students to opt out, plus it was, in a sense, government endorsement of religion. The second major case here related to the freedom from religion was Abingdon Township v. Shen, also in the 1960s. Essentially, many school districts, but especially the Abingdon Township 
um, which I believe was also in New York, but I could be wrong about that, had practiced Bible reading. And again, as part of this idea of we need to morally and spiritually educate students. But the practice of the Abingdon Township was to just read the Bible without comment. Because if you would comment on it as a teacher, you'd be commenting from your own religious tradition. Right? A Jewish teacher would bring Judaism and how they interpreted the Bible, a Protestant, a Catholic. And so the idea was, well, if we just read the Bible without making any sort of comment on it, interpreting or anything, just kind of reading the Bible, um, this would be a non-sectarian activity, a moral activity. I mean, we're, we're trying to teach students to be moral. Uh, and Bible reading had been part of uh, public school since it began in the United States. So it had a long history. In Abingdon Township as well, they provided the opportunity for students, for parents and students, to opt out. Right? So the student didn't have to sit through the Bible reading. Multiple translations were used um, so that uh, they would not try to privilege uh, Protestantism over Catholicism or even Christianity over Judaism. Because in the 19th century, for example, there was, there was a Catholic protest because in some places students were required to learn the Ten Commandments from the King James Version. But I don't know if you know this, but there's a difference among Jews, Protestants, and Catholics over what the Ten Commandments are. There's a different way of how Protestants and Catholics group the Ten Commandments. Right? And so, I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no gods before me, are kind of connected, or you shall have no gods before me and not make any graven images, are connected, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, is split from you shall not covet your neighbor's possessions. Made into two commandments, while Protestants consider that to be one. Right? But here are these Catholic students being forced to learn the Protestant version of the Ten Commandments. And Jews even have a different version as well. And it all, it all has to do with how that passage in Exodus 20 should be broken up. Like, what's commandment one, what's commandment two? And so the decision was, by, you know, in the 20th century, we'll use multiple translations, right, from the Jewish version of the Hebrew Bible, Protestant, Catholic, that'll, pro that'll solve the problem. It didn't solve the problem. Uh, because as you know, if you've been through public school, there isn't Bible reading. Some parents worried that if their children opted out, their children and the parents would be looked upon as atheists. And in fact, Schiff, who brought the, uh, the case, was a Unitarian, uh, so religious, um, although not Orthodox Christian. And of course, atheists had a problem with the practice in general. The court ruled that by providing parents the opportunity to opt out of the practice, that the school district recognized it was a religious practice. It was not simply a moral practice. That by saying you can opt out of it, they were saying this isn't just a neutral moral exercise, this is religious in nature. And so Bible reading was removed from public schools as well. Now certainly there have been other rulings by the, the Supreme Court that have said, you know, you can have a course on the Bible as literature in public schools, or some other thing, you know, a world religions course where you learn about world religions. But essentially what we have here is this, this um, further trying to define what separation of church and state means. But it's always been muddy when you look at the Supreme Court, <laughs> because you'll see cases like this where, you, where we would say Christianity seems to be losing some of its influence. And then there would be other cases where he would say, right, they're arguing here from a Christian type of mindset in supporting a law. Um, and so, you know, it's a very complicated history. But what it reflects is the United States trying to come to terms with there are more people than just Christians in the United States. How does the First Amendment protect them? Any questions or any places I need to, to clarify something about these three court cases, there's others we could talk about. Um, but I think these kind of give us an idea of, of what the situation was like.